Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Conway, and today I'm going to be talking about Amazon RDS for Postgres and explaining not only what kind of security options they have built in, but how you can take advantage of the options to build a comprehensive security policy for your database. This is definitely a beginner's talk for those unfamiliar with RDS, so if you're expecting you know, advanced topics, you should definitely leave and see Grant McAllister's talk tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and um, my presentation will be uploaded after the conference is over on, on the main website, I'm assuming, so don't worry about writing down any, from any information or anything. Um, so I'll be starting by talking about what exactly um, RDS is, some of the main features, how to set up an instance, and I'll be wrapping up um, with Amazon's policies and data ownership and PCI compliance. Um, and then next up are sections on user, database, and network management, auditing and analyzing logs, monitoring your database, and backups in database recovery. So Amazon Relational Database Service, or Amazon RDS, is a web service that allows for setting up, operating, and scaling a relational database in the cloud. It's considered to be a managed database, allowing the user to not have to worry about common database administration tasks. For example, this service manages some more common tasks such as provisioning, patching, backup, recovery, failure detection, and repair. In order to assist in delivering a managed service experience, RDS doesn't um, provide any host access to DB instances, and it restricts access to certain system procedures and tables that require advanced privileges. Overall, it's relatively cheaply priced and allows for the fine tuning of your database. And depending on your point of view, this could be good or bad. So for example, if you not want to not worry about the database at all, or if you've had no experience in databases before or a cloud service, it's not the best route to pick. Um, however, if you, however, if you know what you're doing and you want to have extremely granular control over your database and the different aspects of it, it's a good choice. Um, the user has good control over many different parameters of the database, such as access, security, monitoring alerts, and so on and so forth. Um, because of this, it's probably, I would say, the best cloud database in the market right now and offers the most configuration control out of those offered. Um, so yeah, and um, RDS has support for several versions of Postgres. Um, currently, 9.3.1 through 9.4.4 are available. Uh, nothing earlier than 9.3.1 to support it. Um, I also wanted to include this link on the bottom. Um, I only found it a few days ago. Gabrielle actually told me about it. Um, if I had found it when I was first learning about RDS, it would have been fabulous because, um, <laughs> sorry, Grant, but Amazon Web Services kind of has very confusing name, uh, names for everything. You know, like EC2 or Glacier or CloudTrail. Like, what is that supposed to mean, right? So this link actually takes it and defines it in a very understandable manner. So I thought you guys might find that useful. So RDS for Postgres has several features built in for ease of use and better performance, most notably PostGIS, which is a spatial database extender, full text searching, support for HStore and JSON data types, and the PGStat statements extension, which allows you to track statistics for all executed statements. You also have the Postgres FDW extension built in, which lets you read and write to data stored in foreign tables, um, and in foreign servers as if they were lo um, local tables. Um, in addition to all of that, there's two especially convenient features of RDS, which sets it apart from any other database in the market, auto minor version upgrade and multi-AZ. The first of those two features, um, auto minor version upgrade, automatically upgrades minor versions of Postgres, as you might have guessed from the name, slightly obvious. Um, and the second is multi-AZ, which automatically maintains a synchronous um, standby replica in a different availability zone. Um, so if anything happened that would cause a disruption in service, um, such as a machine or instance failure, then RDS would automatically fail over to the standby so that the database can remain running without the need for an administrator. Each availability zone is about five through 15 miles away from each other, and there are three clusters of these in the USA and 11 clusters worldwide. Um, if necessary for larger organizations, you can even choose the option to choose um, multi-region architecture, but from what I've heard, there's severe latency issues with that, so it's not exactly recommended. So overall, RDS has many really good competitive features. 
Uh, but I did want to mention three cons to using RDS, and the first is that there's very limited control over your database, um, technically. Um, as many options as RDS offers the user, the fact is that you don't have absolute control over your database, um, as you would as a Postgres super user on your own local instance. And secondly, you can't force SSL connections as of yet with RDS, although I talked to Grant uh, yesterday about it, and he says there might be something in the works for that. Um, so, looking forward to that. And thirdly, this is not a database suitable for a company with extensive privacy or security needs, because really, if your company requires a foolproof policy, uh, you shouldn't be looking at a cloud database as a solution anyway. So, RDS is priced primarily by smaller units of individual resource usage. So because of this, it's, this, it's very variable what the price can be. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details of that, but there are three things I want to mention specifically, which might help. First, if you want to experiment with RDS, just to get a feel for it, just to practice, you get one year free of the cheapest plan when you first sign up. Um, secondly, Amazon provides an online cost calculator, which you can use to calculate your approximate monthly and or upfront cost. So if you have some idea of the services you wanna use and where you're going with it, you can use that to get an estimate. And thirdly, there is a free tool provided by Amazon called Billing Alerts and Notifications, which allows you to be up to date on your bill at all times and helps you keep tabs on it and make sure that you're not spending more money than you're expecting to be spending. So setting up RDS is rather easy. Um, on the AWS console, you would go to the Instances tab on the left menu, and then you get this page. Obviously, you would, would hopefully want to be selecting Postgres. And then, um, <sighs> Then it asks you if you want to enable multi-AZ and provision IOPS. Um, if you're just playing around with it and you just want, you want to use a free performance tier, you can't enable these because it will charge you for it, unfortunately. Um, but uh, obviously if you want to use it, you want to enable it here. And um, next you want to specify the details for your database setup. The only parameters that you'll want to be concerned with is first the database version. So, Hopefully you'll be picking 9.4.4, or otherwise you can do the latest one, which is 9.4.1. And then you select an instance class based on your processing and memory requirements for the service. So for this one, I selected db.t2.micro, which is um, a limited test configuration setup. It's mostly just useful for testing the setup and connectivity to the database. Um, but there's many different types that you can use that I've included a link to in the bottom, so you can do research on that if necessary. Next, again, you can choose whether or not you want to enable multi-AZ. Again, for this example, I'm gonna select no. Um, and after that, you can choose your storage type, choosing between magnetic, general purpose, or provisioned IOPS. Magnetic storage, also called standard storage, is the most cost-effective and is considered to be the best for instances with light or burst I.O. requirements. And general purpose is SSC backed and is considered to be faster and better suited for like medium sized instances. Um, and provisioned IOPS is the most costly, but it's also the best option for people who need consistent performance um, without fail. <coughs> On the next page, we have the advanced configuration settings to, to deal with, starting with the VPC and the subnet groups. Um, so for this, if you have a specific VPC that, you're, that you need to set up with very specific rules and the gateway and all that, you need to set that up before creating your RDS instance um, because you need to assign your instance to that VPC as you're setting it up. Um, otherwise, you would just have to destroy the um, RDS instance and recreate it, assigning it to the correct VPC at that point. Um, by default, it assigns, you know, of course, default VPC and you can modify security groups to that um, without a problem, so you can always just do that. Um, so the next parameter asks if you want your database to be publicly accessible outside of your VPC. Um, so obviously if you're trying to design your database securely, you'll want to set this to no, <laughs> and again set up a VPC group to keep your database isolated from the network other than through connections that you specifically allow. Under database options, you can define your database name, port, and parameter groups. You can leave it in the parameter group setting as default to begin with because that can be modified later on. Um, 
and then you can assign, or you can create it now actually and assign your instance to that right then. Because I'm creating a small size instance in, the, in this example, I can't actually um, enable encryption for this. Um, however, there is a at rest encryption service offered by Amazon for medium to large size instances. Um, very specific ones, I think they are listed on the link that I included on the previous slide. Um, I'll be talking a bit, a slight more about it later on in the talk. And then finally you have the backup and maintenance sections of the setup and all of that's obviously very self-explanatory and can be left up to your discretion. Um, the only thing I would want to mention is that you can retain backups for up to 35 days. So really quickly I just want to show the VPC pages for setting it up. Um, if you wanted to connect to your database from the EC2 instance, you would need to make sure that both the EC2 instance and the VBC are assigned, or and the, um, I'm sorry, RDS are assigned to the same security group. Um, and you would just want to have a rule in there that says all TCP traffic should be directed back to the same security group. And they should be able to access it just fine. Um, obviously that's a good connection. And then if you wanted to specifically use PSQL to access RDS by itself, add in a rule, um, do all TCP with an all port range and point back to your public IP. So next up, we have data ownership. Um, really, I'd like to go over this because it seems to be a common concern. Um, I mean, according to le Amazon's legal agreement, who owns your data anyway? Um, according to their agreement and sections of their documentation, customers retain full ownership and control of their content. Additionally, their content will not be viewed, moved, or used unless authorized by the customer. The only circumstance where this isn't the case is where they are legally required to disclose and move content in the event of like a court order or something like that. Um, and AWS also has to notify the customer when able before disclosing their data. Um, to allow for the customer potentially seeking protection um, from disclosure if they wanted to, if they were able to. Um, this policy applies to all content stored on the system, including any s information stored by the end users. Another noteworthy point is that customers can choose the AWS region or regions in which their content and servers are located. So in the instance that a customer has a geographically specific requirement um, or a a legal requirement, they would be able to choose a location where their services would then be deployed. Customers can also replicate and backup content in more than one region. You can view the full privacy policy um, agreement on the link provided on the slide. The second topic that may interest you is regarding Amazon Web Services compliance with PCI standards. According to their website, all services that involve the processing, storage, and transmission of credit or debit card information have been validated as being compliant with PCI standards. The scope of this aforementioned compliance applies to all AWS data centers except for Beijing. Because AWS has been certified as a PCI service provider, uh, customers who use it in a manner that involves the storing, processing, or transmitting of credit or debit card information can rely on Amazon's PCI compliance validation and therefore can simplify their own policies. Um, also, Amazon Web Services rather recently partnered with a company named Initian, I think I'm pronouncing that right, um, which is a qualified security assessor company in order to produce a workbook for PCI compliance in the cloud. So you can use this um, because it provides a comprehensive look at the methodologies Amazon uses for deploying PCI compliance capability, as well as three sample environments setups that you can copy if you wanted to. It also has general advice and strategies for using Amazon Web Services to meet the 12 top level PCI requirements, as well as links and tips for configuring the use of AWS in a PCI compliant manner. I'd now like to discuss securing the user level of your database, beginning with a quick introduction to the identity and access management service and a general security policy that's good for either imitation or implementation. Identity and access management, or IAM, is a service provided by Amazon that enables AWS customers to manage users and user permissions in their database. When you set up roles using IAM, you're essentially creating a JSON document consisting of one or more statements. Each statement defines what actions a user equipped with this role may perform. Uh, just to illustrate, I just wanted to include a screenshot or a sequence of screenshots to show the steps to creating a role. It's very simple, but I wanted to include them so you could see the scope of the permissions that um, can be assigned. 
So I'm just using the AWS console here. Uh, you go to Identity and Access Management and click Create a New Role. You set the name to whatever you'd like, select the role type, and then um, it the purpose of this role I'm creating is for RDS administration. So I allowed the user to have um, full RDS access and EC2 um, read-only and VPC read-only and CloudTrail read-only. Um, and obviously that's just a very basic setup. Just so, and I, like I said, the purpose of this was just to show you all the different policies that can be done using, um, using their policy generator. So um, AWS published a list of the 10 best practices for the service in January of this year, and I wanted to share those. This list can be used as, as a security policy guideline to follow and implement in your database, and I've provided a follow-up link at the bottom of the slide where you can do more research if you're interested. First, it seems to be widely recommended across all different articles and forums that you should never use your root account to access AWS. Instead, it's much more secure to create individual users for access to your account. Um, this, way, th yeah. this way, each IAM user has a unique set of security credentials and user-specific permissions. Secondly, you should only grant permissions that are necessary for the user to uh, perform only the tasks that they need to do. Uh, start with an extremely minimal set of permissions and grant more as, as you need them. Third, you should use policy conditions, like the ones we saw before, to add more granularity when defining permissions. The more explicitly you can define the availability of your resources and who can access it, the safer your resources will be. Using policy conditions can also prevent your AWS users from accidentally performing privileged actions that you definitely didn't want them to do. Um, fourth, you can enable logging of AWS API calls to gain greater visibility into users' activity in your AWS resources using the Amazon Web Service CloudTrail. Logging lets you see which actions users have taken, which services have been used, and what users might have, had to, might have tried to access, in addition to the time and date of any lo events logged and any failed access attempts due to inadequate permissions. Um, I'll be briefly going over CloudTrail again uh, later on when we get to the logging and auditing section of the talk. The article also suggests as a fifth point to design a password policy using their service on IAM involving configuration factors such as password expiration, password strength, um, and reuse of old passwords to ensure that your users and data are protected by strong credentials. Um, you can also even enable multi-factor authentication to, um, and like with your password policy. Um, I'll be showing screenshots of this also, just so you can see what it looks like. Six, you can supplement users, usernames and passwords by requiring a one-time password during authentication, which allows you to enable extra security for you know, privileged IAM users or people who are allowed access to very sensitive resources. And last but not least, you can generate and download a credential report that lists all the users in your Amazon Web Services account in addition to the status of their various credentials. This report can then be viewed to determine which haven't been used recently so you can read them out. This allows for less attack surface and less to protect. So I have a quick example here of um, how to create a role. It's very similar to Postgres. It's just, you know, the, uh, um, RDS accounts are initially created with a single master user and password. Um, and typically you would have, you know, the database administrator be the master user, but if necessary, you can always create more and um, def better define their access privileges. So the, this master user is automatically assigned to the RDS super user role, which is a predefined role similar to the Postgre default um, Postgres super user role. This role is obviously the most privileged on your database instance and should not be assigned to users unless they require maximum administrative permissions. Um, so the example here just shows how to create the user and then grant the user the RDS super user role. And again, you can use the same grant command to grant the um, RDS admin role we created earlier to an existing user. I also, uh, and here's the password policy. Um, as you can see, you can enforce a very thorough, if a bit annoying, um, password policy through the available options. <laughs> I'd like to go into a bit more detail into fine-tuning permissions, defining the set of tables and objects users can access, as well as the operations they can perform. 
By default, when Postgres database objects are created, they receive public access privileges. So it's obviously advised to revoke all privileges to a database and then add them back as you need them. Um, again, it goes back to the suggestion of granting least privilege. As a master user, you can remove all privileges from a database using the above command. Um, and at that point, you can add them back. So revoke all in database, you know, Mortar if I'm public. No one can access Mortar. Then you can grant connect on, on the database Mortar to Frodo. Frodo enters the database. Uh, note that on a local instance, you, can, you would be able to specify this in the pghba.com file. But when using Postgres on the cloud level, it's better to restrict and manage them at the Postgres level. The reason being that changes to the pghba.com file require a server restart. So it's actually impossible to edit it in RDS. Next up is the configuration of various database level settings in the form of parameter groups. Essentially, parameter groups are a container for engine configuration values. They're applied to one or more database instances. Uh, they're equivalent to PostgreSQL.com for all intents and purposes. There are different default configuration settings according to each database version and each instance type selected. You can modify these defaults with your own settings during the initial setup of your database and save them as your own parameter group to assign to that database in addition to any future databases created. Uh, this initial setup can be slightly time consuming to many various configurations available, including VPC, subnet groups, and public accessibility. Uh, but it's obviously worth it to take the time to go through that. After the initial setup, you can continue to modify your parameter group as necessary by using commands such as alter database, alter role, and set. Um, note that you can't use a command like Postgres command because there is no access to the host. Um, there are a few important points I'd like to mention. Uh, the first is that you can copy an existing group with the RDS copy db parameter group commands. Um, copying a parameter group is obviously kind of convenient if you've already created a parameter group and you want to include most of the custom parameters from that um, and modify them a bit. Secondly, all changes made to dynamic parameters are applied immediately after a save, despite the apply immediately setting checkbox. So if you don't even check that, it's still going to apply it immediately. Um, but when you change a static parameter and save, the parameter change takes effect after manually rebooting the instance using the RDS console or explicitly calling the reboot DB instance API action. Again, parameter groups work much in the same manner as PostgreSQL.conf. And thirdly, when changing the parameter group associated with the instance, the instance has to be manually rebooted before the new group um, will be used with the instance. Um, I'm just saying that just because I spent a good hour trying to figure out why it wasn't working until I tried rebooting it and turned it off and on again. There we go, it worked. <laughs> um, and finally, be sure to always exercise proper secure practices such as backing up your data before modifying a parameter group and testing all changes on a test instance before applying them to a production instance. I especially recommend taking a snapshot of your database before making changes as of, um, I've heard that instances will occasionally fail to reboot if a parameter group is configured incorrectly. Um, if this happens, the only thing you can do is destroy the instance and try try again. No? Nope. <laughs> I told you how to fix it. <laughs> okay, so apparently there's a way to fix it. If you want to know how to fix it, ask him. I'll have to do the same. <laughs> you reset your parameter group, reboot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ignore that last point. I didn't say it. Grant's right. Um, and then finally, <laughs> so finally, uh, keeping track of Postgres parameter settings can be a bit difficult, and you can use the above command to list current parameter settings in the default value. Um, and the link below lists all parameters that can be modified in the instance, along with an explanation of each. So RDS allows you to encrypt connections between your applications and your database instances by enforcing SSL. Um, SSL support is available in all regions for Postgres, and if you choose to enable it, um, the, the certificate includes database instance endpoint as a common name in order to guard against spoofing attacks. Um, if you choose to use SSL for all connections coming in and out of the database, you'll need to install the SSL um, extension using the create extension SSL info command, um, which is shown there, and um, 
It also shows how to call the SSL is use function to determine if SSL is being used. Um, obviously, it true, returns T if it's using SSL, otherwise F um, for true and false. And one quick note for Amazon S3 users, um, I've noticed that if you ever want to use your bucket over SSL, using a period in the name will cause you to get a certificate mismatch um, error. And you can't change bucket names once you've created them, so you'd have to copy everything to a new buck bucket, which is obviously very time consuming and error prone. Um, I'm not 100% sure if you'll actually need these instructions. Um, I notice whenever I set up a new instance, it would automatically cr um, connect using SSL. Um, I think it, there must be like an SSL preferred option somewhere. There's, Is that correct? There's multiple levels of SSL. There's one that validates certificates. The default isn't. So if you don't download the certificate, you still will do with SSL. You're just not validating any the, you're not validating that you're actually talking to the thing you think you're talking to. Okay. You're doing it, Doing it securely. <laughs> you don't know. You're doing it encrypted. That's yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> yeah. 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 So anyways, this is pretty self-explanatory, um, pretty general steps. Just download the public key, import it into your operating system, um, connect over SSL by appending the SSL mode equals required to your connection string, and use the SSL root cert parameter to reference a public key. For example, um, SSL root cert equals rds-ssl-ca-cert.pem. And then you can verify the endpoints using the SSL mode equals verify-full command. Um, if everything is um, configured correctly, the encrypted status of your connection ought to be shown when you connect to the database instance in the logon banner. So briefly, um, I, d I d actually didn't discover the servers until a few days ago. It wasn't very well publicized, unfortunately, but um, Amazon Web Services offers a service called Key Management Service, or KMS. Um, and this is a managed encryption solution that allows for at-rest encryption of your data. It looks like it came out about January of this year. Um, before that, there was previously no way to encrypt at rest um, storage for Postgres. So that's why I wanted to specifically manage that. You can define management policies and enforce set policies using KMS rather easily. Um, and you can create identity and access management users or roles from your account to handle key management for your database. Obviously, this is recommended. According to the documentation on the website, there are several key management functions available through Amazon service, including the ability to create keys with a unique alias or description. Um, also, you can define which IAM users and roles can manage keys, which users and roles can use keys to encrypt or decrypt data, whether or not you want those keys to be rotated annually. Um, you can also disable or re-enable keys. And finally, you can audit the use of these keys using uh, CloudTrail. No one has access to the master keys, and there's several built-in precautions to ensure the absolute protection of your master keys, such as never storing them in plain text, not persisting them in memory, and limiting the connections to the device. I'd now like to talk about securing your database at the network level. Previously, there were two ways to accomplish this, through database security groups and VPC groups. However, as of December 14th in 2013, you can no longer create database security groups. Um, and instances created after that date, making VPC security groups the only option. So that's what, the only thing I'm going to be talking about today. VPC security groups are used to secure uh, your network and isolate it to a limited set of IP addresses and ensure that only authorized users can access your database instance. It, it's essentially a virtual firewall that controls the incoming and outgoing traffic for one or more instances. When an instance is launched, one or more security groups are associated with the instance and manage all connections through permitting or not permitting traffic according to any rules that you've configured. By default, security groups allow all outbound traffic and you can't change any of the outbound rules. And also, security group rules are always permissive. There's no defined rules that can deny access. Um, and also, if there's more than one rule for one specific port, the most permissive rule is all automatically applied and it overrules anything else. 
For example, if you have a rule that only allows access to the SSH port from, uh, from a very specific address, like 203.1.3.211, and then another one that allows access to that same port from everyone, then everyone's gonna be allowed to join. Doesn't matter that you have the one other rule. Um, it's considered to be good practice to have a condensed policy as multiple security groups can be assigned to a single instance, with occasionally resulting in hundreds of rules that are applied. There's a default security group per region which is automatically as associated with the instance unless changed during the initial setup. Um, it's named default, obviously, and has an automatically assigned ID. The default settings are to allow inbound traffic only from other instances assigned to the same security group. So for example, if you wanted to access RDS from an EC2 instance, you'd be able to do so as long as they were both assigned to the same default VPC. And the second one is you can allow all outbound traffic from an instance. The rules for the group can be modified, but it can't be deleted. And if you try it, an error will occur saying that the security group default is reserved. And of course, you can always create your own groups and associate them with your database instances as necessary. Multiple security groups can be created in order to better fit the needs of your instances. Um, they can also be created, copied, and modified in all of the console. Um, yeah. Oh, I must have skipped one. Okay. So now it's time to discuss best practices for PPC security groups. Um, because they're so e um, easy to configure, the abilities are often abused and people rarely take the time to learn good security practices for them. Um, since they just set them up and leave them alone, they're like, hey, it works, right? Why fix it? So one thing I want to mention is that you should always have a proper naming convention for your security group as it allows for better management of what occasionally ends up being hundreds of security groups. So the naming convention should probably follow a enterprise standards that you define for your company. For example, it could follow the, um, the notation AWS region plus environment code plus OS type plus tier plus application code. So the example below it would be, uh, it's North America for a development environment using Linux um, for the website tier and there's like a four letter code for um, just B424, it's just a randomly generated code for the application. You should also try and make sure that's not self-explanatory, so if someone got in your system, they would know, you know, obviously if you had something named Ubuntu Web CRM prod, they would know exactly what that is, and they would know exactly what to hit. You can also set up alerts through email or the EC2 console for when an event occurs involving the modification or deletion of rules in critical security groups, so action can be taken immediately. You can use it for detection and alerts for when unusual activity is detected based on the normal patterns observed in your production environment. You also want to avoid creating the least restrictive security groups like 0.0.0 slash 0, which is open to everyone. And in the same vein, you should avoid keeping your SSH port open to the public for emergency remote support it's far better to allow a very specific IP address in your security groups for SSH access. And finally, you should avoid using the default security groups, which are automatically created. Uh, take the time to like, re like re do research and build a comprehensive policy for your security groups to follow and specify those for your in instances. So I've mentioned CloudTrail a few, um, a few times now. So by now you know that it's a auditing service that provides a full history of API calls and related events in your RDS instance. There are several features offered by the service allowing companies to comply with many uh, laws and regulations, such as the ability to set up alerts for the creation or misconfiguration of log files, triggered log files associated with system changes, um, and log file storage. It ensures that all logging processes follow regulatory standards such as PCI compliance. Um, it's advised, once again, to use IAM to create a dedicated role for log, log management. Um, it's also useful to set up a script to parse through the large collection of logs that you would get from this in order to find particular information that's of concern to your company. Uh, there's several examples of scripts that you can find um, looking it up on Google if you're interested. There's, I found many like on different forums and stuff like that. You can find one that's best suited for you. Overall though, um, the logs are not easy to reliably obtain and uh, there's no promise that they'll fix this. If you have a need to do detailed logs, I've heard that it's possible to put a trigger on a table 
that when a record is inserted or updated, you can log an entry to another table that inserts the date, the information that the user is trying to change, and the information regarding the change itself. While it's possible to do that, if you have a need to do detail logging um, to such a high degree for your company, um, again, RDS isn't the best solution for this. You need to be looking somewhere else um, in terms of like running a local database. Sorry. <laughs> and um, very quickly, I just want to mention you can use a log analyzer such as PG Badger to assist in analyzing your logs. It's written in Perl, auto text the log file format and can parse large log files. Um, I've included the link to the GitHub page um, as well as the RDS extension for it and also a link to the documentation to find the format necessary for using PG Badger with RDS. Um, there are several ways you can track the performance and health of a database or a DB instance. The best way is to use the free Amazon CloudWatch service to monitor your database instance. Uh, CloudWatch provides a variety of metrics related to CPU use, the number of connections, disk space use, memory use, and more. As you can probably imagine, metrics such as this are particularly useful for detecting malicious attacks, such as denial of service. And you can set various alarms, of course, for notifications regarding the status of your database, such as performance deg degradation. There's also an option to set up detailed monitoring. Uh, this does cost three uh, three dollars and fifty cents per instance a mo month more, but this may be not for RDS. Not for RDS? Okay, sounds good. So it's free. So obviously you should definitely try and enable this. Thank you again for clarifying. Ours, our, ours is enabled by default. Okay. Like that's the difference is EC2 has a five minute normally uh, monitoring and they it's extra for one minute. We do one minute for free. We kind of well, for, it's included in the price. <laughs> <laughs> So that works. Um, and then there's a link here at the bottom. Uh, Netflix a while ago provided an extension for RDS called Security Monkey. Uh, I thought it looked pretty neat, so I wanted to include it. Um, it monitors policy changes and alerts on is insecure configurations on your account. Um, its main purpose is obviously security, and it's a useful tool for monitoring your database as it tracks all changes, much like CloudWatch. So RDS automatically has automated backups turned on by default, which enables point-in-time recovery for your instance. Your database and transaction logs are automatically backed up and stored for a specified retention period up to 35 days. You can restore your instance to any second during said period up to the last five minutes. You also have a snapshot option, which is a user-initiated backup of your instance. These backups are stored by RDS until explicitly deleted and you can create a new instance from a snapshot at any time. They can be copied across regions to a geographical migration or ensure recovery in the event of a disaster. And that's it. Any questions? Sounds good. Oh, question? I'm not actually sure. It's, it's disk level encryption, so it's the same encryption that EDS support. So we use the same technique, uh, same key matching system. I don't know if you've seen the EDS one, but yeah, it's a disk space. Well, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a virtual disk, but yeah, it's at the block level. So is there a separate key for each? Yes. Okay. I mean, you can you can use your like. So the option is there's a default key you can use, or you can assign your own individual key. And you can have the right. same one or ones depending on what you want to do so you control sort of the policy and the revocation. Is it at an instance level or can we Sorry, configure, what? Is it at an instance level or can it be configured at a database level? Uh, it's at an instance level. It's at the storage level, so yeah, it's just it's all or nothing basically. Uh, and when you turn on encryption at rest, you also we um, we do a separate encryption of the log files that we, we send to S3, uh, which is done differently obviously. Is that going to be easy? Yes, that works. You have, to, you have the same set of keys. Yeah, you would end up with the. Now, there's the there's the difference between there's, there's multiple levels of keying, right? So you have like a master key that surrounds like your key, but you can you generate basically a new key for it. It doesn't re-encrypt the data; it just re-encrypts like it's a different wrapper around the the master key. Does that make sense? I would explain key stuff horribly. <laughs> <laughs> things around things around things, but. 
it does allow you to have sort of separation without having to go and rekey the entire information. Although I think, I think that's one thing we're looking at doing as well as uh, having options to actually re-encrypt depending on what you're going to do with the data. Like if you want to give it to a third party, you'd actually be able to re-encrypt it um, with a different key and actually re-encrypt the whole data as well. But I'm not sure. It's just one of those things we've discussed as, as a, an addition. So are the keys backup as part of the backup? Or uh, the keys are held separately. Uh, as part of our, and they're encrypted and a bunch of stuff around the key. I mean, the key man, we don't basically do it. It's all based on the key management system. Okay. So we work with the KMS system internally. And essentially what you're doing is you're giving us a grant to, to use your key. And we actually log the uh, the request to using that key. Well, if we're not doing it now, we're going to do it shortly, but I'm pretty sure we're doing it now. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, some of the stuff we discussed, and then I don't know where, where it ends up, but it will actually log every time, so like every time you start your instance, we go ask KMS for your key, we log that we requested that. So you can actually see via your um, cloud trail logs who, for KMS, who has requested your key. So if you're like, wait, there's an instance I don't know that's requesting my key, right? Um, you'd be able to see that as well. Very nice. Actually, have a really good security question. Nazby, I noticed you had a question? Uh, I think it was answered, but basically, Well, we don't support it today, uh, but it is, oh. it is one of those things that we are working on uh, doing. Uh, it's just a little more complex because then we're talking to, we basically have to get two with the KMS talking to KMS as well as us talking to our, you know, other region. So it's, uh, it's something that we're working on. Josh? Did you check how much of a performance hit uh, turning encryption on this? Uh, I did not actually. I didn't have time to do that. My understanding from the tests I saw was very minimal, which is why uh, it's on a very particular set of machines because of the CPU types. Uh, we have some older types that uh, don't actually have uh, the necessary uh, offload on them. So all the ones that you see supported are because they support offload, which makes it pretty much a, you know, not really a big impact at all to the system. You get a little more jitter than what we see, but, but typically not, not enough to cause an issue. Well, it's available in some of the lower ones, but it's um, it's also uh, based on essentially the newer classes as they come out because they have the newer hardware that supports it. So we will at some point have like the equivalent of a T2 micro that will support encryption. Um, it'll probably just be the next generation one, uh, which will be on more modern uh, CPUs. Not that they're on that old, but. So a quick question on that part. We tested the uh, performance with encryption on and off. Um, how much data? Sounds good. That's it then. Thank you. Thank you.